Well, first of all, welcome to everybody to the Learning Two virtual threads. These are a series of conversations Learning Two has been doing over the last month, almost, maybe more. And uh, this one is one that I think, uh, with the progression of uh, our respective situations, it seems timely to share and see how we can support each other and share some strategies. The way we're going to do it, just if you have not been part of one of these Learning Two virtual threads, if you could use your uh, raised hand once we open the floor, and I'll write your name down and make sure everybody gets a voice. If you can just mute your mics while you're not talking. And uh, we'll start with, my name is John Micton. I'm one of the mentors and coaches for Learning to Europe. And you have Simon, who's our director of operations, and Stephen, who's hiding between, oh, there you are, Stephen. Uh, who is the director of IT for Learning2. And uh, we're going to kick off with, uh, we're very fortunate, we have three guests, panelists, who are going to share. Uh, that's, uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a few minutes. And the idea is that we'll have 15 minutes share out and then really open the floor because everybody has different contexts and different situations. You have local laws, regional laws and maybe your own parameters at your board or your leadership team might have uh, decided to explore. One thing is for sure, reopening schools is extremely complex. I'm talking to a few people. I think it's easier to go online than come back. And pivoting back is full of complexity. There's a lot of emotion, anxiety. There's organizational aspects, it's just the logistics. And you have all these different stakeholder groups, your parents, your students, your faculty, your staff, and then the local authorities and the community, and juggling all those is quite complex. Our three guests are from the International School of Luxembourg, and they'll explain the context and the idea is that they're going to share some of their workflows more as a provocation. This is not to say that everybody has to do what we're doing, but just give you a context, and then also get, hopefully, input from other people, what they're doing, what they're juggling, and what are some of the things that they feel uh, are of interest to share to the larger group. So with no further delay, I'm going to turn to uh, I'd like uh, our three ISL guests just to introduce themselves. I'll start with David and then Steve and mm -hmm. Phil, just the way the boxes fall. If you can just uh, share a little about your role and a, a quick reflection, and then we'll go to your presentations. David. Hi, David. thanks very much, John. I'm David Walker. I'm the Deputy Lower School Principal uh, in the International School of Luxembourg. Um, and uh, opening up the school, it's uh, quite an interesting endeavor we're about to embark on. So it's uh, scary, interesting, and um, full of all sorts of new endeavors that we're going to have to do. Thank you very much, David. And our next panelist is Steve. Hi everybody, so my name is Steve. I'm Head of Facilities and Security at ISL. And I'm, let's say, now in charge a little bit more about the operational part from the re-entry uh, in the um, beginning of, of May uh, soon. Thank you, Steve. And uh, Phil? Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity to, to chat to you this evening. Um, my name is Phil Peach. I'm the deputy principal in the upper school section at ISL. Um, and um, my normal day-to-day -day role is to look after the, the, the success of uh, students and teachers in the middle school section. But I have a kind of second string where I look at the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the upper school section, grade 6 through 12, and I include things like the uh, schedule and the uh, duties and, uh, and all that kind of stuff and, uh, and I think that's that's why I'm part of this working group uh, looking at the reopening of schools. So great to be here, looking forward to our conversation. Okay, we have a, a, a guiding question for tonight which I'm going to share with you just to give us a, a context and uh, the guiding question is while it loads up with some countries now exploring a gradual, cautious reopening, what do you feel as an international school leader, leadership team, are some of the creative tensions uh, to engage with your school community for re-entry, being mindful every school and context is quite different. 
And what I'll ask is if Steve could uh, start off from the operational side. And uh, thank you, Steve. No problem, John. Uh, can I share also my screen? Yes, you can. Let me just get out yeah. of this. And Simon, is there a way we can uh, open the share screen to all the participants? It should be on for everybody. Okay, so Steve, you should be good to share, yeah? Yep. Thank you. So, um, yes, so we are since March 16 um, in kind of confinement, kind of lockdown here in Luxembourg. And um, the Ministry of Education announced on April 16 that the schools will reopen in a staggered way. So um, on May 11, our upper schools in Luxembourg will, will start again. And on May 25, uh, our lower school will then reopen also. We have uh, since January 28, the crisis team who um, is working every day on, on this coronavirus um, history, uh, thing. Um, what, we found, what we found very interesting and um, important is the daily communication. We started in February 26, and this daily communication to parents and staff every day was very well um, appreciated, and we got only positive feedback from our whole community. So since the Ministry of Education on um, April uh, 16 announced that the school will reopen, um, you guessed that we work nearly night and day to prepare all, all this stuff. Um, the main restrictions from our government for reopening is that we have to split the classes in two cohorts. There, will, there has to be a minimum two meter distance uh, between students and staff in the building as far as possible. Um, we wearing masks in public on school premises and in the school building is mandatory. The wearing mask in the classroom is optional, but again mandatory if we cannot guarantee a two meter distance between students and um, teacher. In Luxembourg, the schools get provided with mask and disinfectant by the Ministry of Health and uh, Education, but uh, the schools also have to provide or have to supply uh, different mater protective materials, which I will explain a little bit later. I'm just talking a little bit fast because I'm quite, I have quite a program, so I just want not to go too much over the five minutes. The crisis team, of course, now to reopen, uh, to, to organize the reopening, um, it's quite a lot of work for only the few people we are in. You see on our organizational chart that our crisis team is the director, the um, uh, chief operations officer, lower school, upper school principals, head of external relations, head of facility security, head of HR and head of ICT. So what we did, we, we organized or that we said we would have nine working groups for different um, tasks. The one, the general coordination group, that's mainly again the, the, the crisis team who at the end take the, um, the decisions on, on what is suggested by the different groups. Then we have a data collection and survey group, which is led by the H, head of HR. And then comes the rest of the stuff is everything for me. So when we start with cleaning and disinfectant, of course, after six weeks in lockdown, um, we need to do a deep cleaning first before everybody is coming back. We have also since February additional um, measures in place like cleaning, uh, hand, uh, regular cleaning handrail, handrails, handles, bathrooms, and other contact points during the day. These measures will be intensified now um, from March 11 on with additional cleaning personnel during the school days so that we can mainly say every hour we have all our um, contact points which are clean and disinfectant. After the school day, of course, we have our daily cleaning in the school, like uh, every school. Um, as John already said, that there's a lot of anxiety um, around the, the staff members and the, on the community. And we said them, to reassure our staff, we will provide them with a disinfectant kit. This disinfectant kit is um, composed by a spray bottle with disinfectant, a paper roll to wipe everything off, 
disinfectant wipes, masks, and gloves. Um, so every staff member can disinfect his um, classroom or his office uh, just as he thinks it's necessary to do. Um, on the security group, uh, what we will add there is that to, um, additional to our normal security in the buildings, we will put three um, additional security guards outside um, just to manage and to control the visitors and parents coming to school. Because the Luxembourg government told us that we are not allowed to have visitors and parents in the school, except if there is an uh, urgent meeting. The next group is the facility group. That's in mainly my, that's my team. What we are doing now is we are rearranging every classroom. So it means we have to see that we set up the classrooms that in between the desk, which can be used by the students, we have two meter distance. Of course, what we face is that we have a lot of teachers who have different decoration styles and um, there are classrooms which are more or less uh, filled with other stuff than just the student's desk. And um, that's for us for the moment a challenge. We, we started today and we already see that we have classrooms where we cannot fit in half of the desks as needed because we have too much around. Then also we have to set up what we said school decided that we will take for everybody who is coming to the school and entering the building, we will take the temperature. I will come to this a little bit later at the end because with, with more details. Um, another recommendation or requirement from the government was that we have to um, organize the corridors inside the buildings in kind of one-way corridors so that we have not that we avoid as much as possible crossings from students and staff members. Um, coming to the supplies the um, supplies we ordered already before we were told when the school was reopening. Um, we ordered masks. Uh, for the moment, we have 35,000 disinfectant, 1,000 liter thermometers, disinfectant wipes, disposable gloves, protective goggles for our nurses, um, special dedicated pins for, for the masks, the used masks and gloves. Protective face shields, um, which we produce in-house with our 3D printers. And then we bought four thermal cameras for the temperature taking in the morning. We estimated the cost for the moment for all these uh, measures uh, between 80,000 and 100,000 euros. Um, I can share with you, for example, the one-way corridors this is, for example, one floor. This is the first floor in the upper school, where you see we dedicated, uh, we have dedicated staircases uh, for to go upwards and downwards. So, as you see, it's really we try to have a one way to circulate around the building. Um, to make this clear to everybody who is in the building, we put those kind of signs on the floor so that everybody sees when you come in where you have to go, what is allowed and what not. Here you see, for example, an example where we put, where we'll make uh, on our map a two meter grid, two by two meter grid, to see in theory what, what is possible in the classroom. So you see that if you have 20, uh, a classroom with 20 desks, um, at the end, it's very challenging when you consider the, the, um, the desk from the teacher that uh, to get this 10 desks in is, um, is really challenging for different classrooms. Um, in terms of catering, we were told by the ministry that um, the canteen cannot open. So what, what is our plan? The plan is that our kitchen, uh, our caterer, they will produce lunch bags. Those lunch bags are required, or the lunch is required to be taken in the classroom. This is for us not possible for different reasons. So we try to find an alternative and uh, as we could not open the canteen, we tried anyway to get uh, the canteen ready 
with desks spaced two meters apart, a little bit like an exam hall um, here in Luxembourg. So we will ask now the Ministry of Education to get permission to do this. This is um, also in terms of logistics, this will simplify the, the life for everybody, for, for the school, for the teachers, for the students, for the kitchen, and, and, and. So we find this an interesting um, way to, to solve the problem. Um, the school buses is less co uh, complicated for us because we don't run the bus service. It's um, that the service which is contracted by the families. Uh, we just have some expectations about the hygiene and that's something we will um, deal with the, with the bus companies. Now we come to the morning temperature screening. Um, I will share another. So that's the map from, um, from our campus. So you have the upper school building. We have the hillside building where we have a few classrooms and mainly administration in, and we have the lower school. Uh, nearly all our campus is fenced by, um, yeah, by, by a fence. Now, how can we get the people through the, my, that we are sure that the, the staff and students go through the temperature taking station? So we tried, or don't we tried, we fenced the front courtyard and we channeled all the people to this point. And we are lucky that we have here a big tent, with, which is a temporary gym. And in this tent, we organized um, a kind of snake lane like on the airport. And at the end, when you come out, there's a thermal camera who take the temperature from the face from the, from the person. If it's under the temperature from 37.5, 30, you will get a, a small coin and you can go to the main entrance where you have to give this coin to security that they know, okay, you passed the screening and you are fine to go in. If we have a person who is above the 37.5, we take this person out in a separated corner where we have a nurse and a counselor which um, reassure this person. And after a while, we take the temperature again to see if it's still high or not. If it's too high, this person has to go home um, or we have to call the parents to pick um, the child to pick the child up again. Um, the red dots, that's our additional security stage of uh, people, which I described before. And then what you see, what else you see is a green line and a red line. And this is especially important for our lower school because the lower school, we have a lot of parents who park on this parking and there is on the right side from this park an underground parking from another Luxembourg school, which we can use. And we have a lot of pedestrians coming to the lower school. For the moment, the plan is that we reduce these pedestrians to the strict minimum and we will ask the parents to come with the cars and to do a drop off on the bus lanes here means for us that we have to organize more resources, more people to open the door and take the little one out and put them again in this snake lane to go to the fever station from the, from the lower school. If we have pedestrians, they use the normal sidewalk as usual, but to return to the car, they have to go this way out, pass a public sidewalk, coming back to our premises. And then we have here a little, let's say a little 20 meters where we have not enough space to really separate the, the two ways. From here on, this is not a problem anymore. And then we go, they go back this way to, to the cars. So that's how we um, organize um, the access uh, to our buildings. So I think I didn't forget no, something. Great, Steve. Thank you so much for the great detail. And of course, we're going to open the floor. So if you have more questions, we can loop back to Steve. Uh, and then, of course, we'd love to hear, I think, share from everybody else impressions and feedback and maybe some of your own plans. I'm next going to ask uh, Phil Keach, if you don't mind, I'm going to share the screen and put your slide up. And Phil, again, yeah. Uh, is uh, talking from the perspective of an upper school. So in the case of our school, that's grade six through 12. Thank you, Phil. 
Hi everyone, and, and thanks, Steve, for, for sharing all the details that you've been uh, you've been working on. Um, I wanted to share with you um, from the, if you like, the educational um, and teaching learning um, uh, lens. Uh, what kind of things we've been challenged with in terms of uh, helping our thinking to develop over the last few days. Um, so one of the things with people like us, and one of the reasons why why we're getting together this evening is because we've all been asked to, to make a, a greater or lesser con contribution to the reopening. And that's because we, we would tend to be strategic thinkers and uh, be solutions uh, orientated and uh, problem solvers and things. But of course, the danger with that is that we, we sometimes have a tendency to, to look at the situation and dive off down the route towards a, a solution that we're absolutely convinced will work. Well, one, once we opened up the conversation to a wider group of, of people, so for example, the Great Advisory Council, the academic leaders, uh, the upper school leadership team, it was amazing how, how much more quickly and to what greater, a deeper level our thinking started to evolve. It really did help, so that would be something to keep in mind. Um, Identifying our biggest challenge about the and, and realizing that there's a there's a fundamental incompatibility between the notion of complying with social distancing rules and sustaining to any level a student-centered 21st century dynamic learning environment. Realizing that early on and establishing a position statement on that, that we understood that fundamental incompatibility that helped us move into the solving the situation problem far quicker. It got us through that mire of, of, of the, 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 the sticky situation of, of, of getting everybody involved in a conversation that said, well, this is ridiculous, it's never going to work. So again, if you can establish a position statement, address the elephant, name the elephant in the room, like we did, um, I would encourage everybody to try and do that. It worked well for us. We're going to rely on people's patience and flexibility, of course, but we also need everyone in school to understand with regard to the social distancing, we have a collective responsibility to, to, to uphold them at all times. And this was a really important thing about accepting our individual accountability should we breach those rules. This was in particular regard to upper school students who, who were envisaging teenagers being restricted and asked to social distance and realizing and accepting the reality that teenagers don't tend to do well in that kind of situation. And it's highly likely that there will be breaches of that individual accountability. And we need to be prepared to step in with a zero tolerance approach because of the not to sound too melodramatic, but the deadly consequences potentially of breaches to it, and teachers needed some kind of reassurance in that regard. Establishing a common understanding of the purpose of the time spent back in school. Somebody in the, the earlier conversations before we got going talked about how wonderfully well the, the virtual learning environment has gone. We, we've seen that here too, and many of us are really, really reluctant to, to, to put that to one side just so that we can get back into school for what amounts to seven weeks before the end of our school year. Continuing on from that, it's important, we felt uh, it proved to be important to our stakeholders to think in terms of a phased approach, moving towards academic learning focus as we got into this strange situation with restricted movement and social distancing and only half the cohort of students and some of our vulnerable staff not in the school. Wrestling with the opposing forces of reconfiguring our schedule and yet trying to retain some familiarity so that teachers and students could, could recognize at least some features of their day in school. That, that continues to be a challenge. The impact on the start of the day for the uh, screening process we have plus minus 330 students, there's half a cohort uh, in our upper school section. 330 students passing through screening in time for an 8.25 uh, period one 
uh, when the screening only opens at 7.30 could well be challenging and we, we're well aware of the, the possible impact on the start of our school day. And we're exploring now uh, uh, how to ensure some degree of equity between student cohorts because of course our time back in school from the 11th of May for the upper school is an odd number of weeks but children are asked to come in week in week out and that means by default that cohort one gets a week extra in school uh, and that's what we're trying to, to, to see if there's a way we can balance that out. I make that 37 seconds over the five minutes, John, I, I apologize, but I hope that was helpful to get everybody uh, thinking along the similar lines to us. Thank you. Fantastic, Phil. Thank you so much. That's really uh, helpful and really nice to have some of those approaches. And I think also this idea of the phase, and I think you really highlighted some of the creative tensions between the different workflows. We'll turn over to David, who's our lower school deputy principal. David, I'll put the slide up for you and we'll go with the same format, yeah? Yep, great, thanks very much. Uh, let me just everybody. get to the slide and... There we go. Thank you so much. Okay, so looking at this, some key factors for us in the lower school. Um, one is the availability of staff and students. And in order to gauge how many staff we'll have uh, in terms of creating class schedules and what the teaching and learning offerings might look at, look like, sorry, uh, we created a short survey, which staff have already uh, undertaken. And that kind of survey has uh, things like what location are they in at the moment? You'd be surprised there might be one or two people who are not in Luxembourg. Uh, health, dependence, and, and other uh, pertinent information to give us uh, the data we need to be able to plan effectively and the same with the students and then we as you can imagine once the government had announced when the different schools were going to reopen that generates huge amounts of questions and so we've started to build our documentation to communicate to the different stakeholders based around a question and answer um, type of format so that these uh, questions evolve, as you can imagine, that the answers to them evolve over time. And we keep adding to the, uh, um, the different questions that keep coming up and refine the information. And from that, we've, we're looking to have uh, narrated slideshows uh, so that for the different stakeholders, staff, parents, students, we can show them as best we can what the um, temperature test will look like, what they will be doing, where they'll be going, what the drop-off will look like in the morning, the pick-up in the afternoon, and so on and so forth, the lunch, etc. as a way of communicating to our stakeholders before they arrive on the 11th of May or the 25th of May, exactly what are they uh, coming into, uh, so we can best prepare them. And then daily operations, going back to what Steve said, we have a number of parameters. And again, just to remind you, we've got the social distancing of two meters, uh, which is defined by the government. Uh, we're trying to mis minimize the number of person-to-person -person interactions and minimizing the amount of movement around the school by uh, all the stakeholders. We also have, as Steve mentioned, the half classes, so half the students in one class in one week and the other half the following week and also the wearing of face masks as required. So those parameters are really dictating what the operations look like. And for example, uh, some of the things that we will be doing would be uh, staggered breaks or uh, staggered arrivals at schools, Phil explained, a staggered uh, leaving of the students at the end of the school day, uh, lunch in the homerooms, one-way hallways, one-way staircase, movement as Steve uh, defined and a number of the special lessons taking place in the homeroom classroom so that the students are minimizing the amount of movement around the school and then of course we don't want to forget the learning obviously the, the government have defined as going back to school as being allowing students to get together and socialize and also to open up the country to start the economy once more but for us also we want to continue the learning and, and Bearing in mind, we have half a class at home during any week and half the class at school, approximately. And so our uh, 
a concept there is to continue with our virtual learning that we have at the moment, continue with the current platforms of Seesaw and Schoology, and then use the opportunity of the students coming into school to give their, to have full access to them and give them more enhanced opportunities with the same learning that their peers will be doing at home. And then finally, as we go through this, as we're all in the same boat, we've not done this before. And so we feel a daily reflection and continued collection of data is really, really important to perfect what we're doing as we've likely forgotten things. We've not quite got it right, right at the beginning. So having that daily reflection upon how it's gone to try and make it a little bit better for the next day is highly desirable. Thank you. And David, just on the lunch thing, so people understand, the lower school is going to have brown bag lunch in the classroom, and the upper school, we, as Steve had mentioned, has petitioned to the Ministry of Education to go into our cafeteria. So that's why you heard two different uh, workflows on the lunch. It's because we're kind of uh, supporting different age groups, and also structurally with the building, it's different. So if you wonder why that, uh, just for, as a point of clarification. David, thank you very much for that, that's really uh, very helpful. I think what I would like to do now is really give you an opportunity, A, to ask questions to our three panelists, Phil, David, and Steve, or if you have something that you want to share, an observation, or maybe something you're going through that you think would really be helpful for others to hear, that's what we want to do. This is an opportunity to share and learn. As David said, and I think it's a very poignant what he said, we're all new at this. Nobody's done this before. There is no map of this. This doesn't exist. Uh, maybe in some dystopian novels you've read or in some sci-fi movies you watched, but uh, this is a new reality, a new normal. And I think that's one of the challenges. And I know that all of us as schools, uh, the students' well-being is at the center, so is our staff and community. And this is very important because at the end of the day, we are fee paying schools and parents have choices. And so the way we deliver and what we do to ensure making them feel safe, uh, that they feel that they're in a place that is listening to them and that we have their child's uh, well-being at the center of our workflows, I think is really important. So with those different contexts and this example, which is just one example, there are many different ones. We are in Luxembourg. We are unique at the International School of Luxembourg that we do work under the auspices of the Ministry of Education. And so they actually have a fair amount of say on levels of functioning, not completely, but this is something that we can't opt out of. That's not an option because I know in some countries, you might have uh, auspices of a ministry, but you have that independence not to do what the locals are. But we can't do that because we actually get a significant amount of funding from the government, which we're very appreciative. So we are a Luxembourg school, but a private school. And there is a group, Patricia, who is our acting head, uh, has uh, brought together all the private schools. And we've had these kind of conversations because we're kind of an anomaly in the sense that we have a lot of independence, but we still have this government mandate that we have to address and support. So what I'd like to do is open the floor. If you could do us a small favor, when you speak, talk, uh, uh, just tell us what school you're at. And if it's not an obvious name in the sense that it, it identifies a country or region, maybe the country you're in and your role. And then we just open it up to the floor and feel free to ask specific questions to our three panelists or whatever you think would be appropriate to share to this group. So uh, raised hands and I'll start taking names down and we'll just rotate. So does anybody have a, yes, Donna, thank you. Right. Yeah, good evening everybody. I'm Donna Philip, the director of the International School of Lyon in France. And uh, we, in about an hour, will know what the government is recommending in terms of reopening for the state schools. We do have the independence, John, that you mentioned to not apply what the government's putting in place. So we can pick and choose really what we do there. So, I mean, the presentations were really, really helpful um, to thinking about our reopening and how we would organize it, even if that's not in complete harmony with what the government recommended. My question is relating to how many classes you'll be inviting in, will you be phasing in different classes at different times. That's what the government's recommending here, that a part of the 
primary school starts, then the following week there's another part and another part, and similarly with the secondary. Are you having all your classes in at the same time? No, we are going to split. So we have about 1,385 kids. And as Phil had mentioned, the upper school, the first week we'll have 330. And then the following week, a new batch of 330. So by the end of the two week period, all the kids will have come to school. Okay. And, and that rotation will, pardon me? They'll be continuing to alternate weeks up following that? Correct. And the same will be replicated in the lower school. And Phil and David, jump in if I'm saying something wrong, but that's the way, uh, that's how the government has presented it to the population of Luxembourg. Yeah. And we're following that. Thank you very much. Any other questions or something people would like to ask our panelists? Yes, Jim, thank you. <laughs> well, hello everyone from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and uh, I'm at uh, EARJ, Escola Americana do Rio de Janeiro, the American School of Rio tech director. Um, we are, are in an interesting uh, position vis-a-vis -vis you all in, in Europe in that we're probably about um, two, two to four to six weeks behind y'all in, in what's going on. Um, we started our, our distance learning um, just about a month ago and um, it, it honestly looks like that the schools, the international schools here will be closed until uh, the end of the school year through June. But so we're looking at what's going to happen in August. And it's very interesting to see what, what type of model that Luxembourg has um, as we're developing our own. Uh, that was interesting. I, I did say what John uh, you said about alternating weeks and are the, uh, uh, with, with regard to half the students in, in any given class coming in uh, one day and then half the next uh, the next one week and the next week or any other schools Doing that kind of alternating pattern Be it on a daily basis. So, you know, one half half of a class is at home doing distance learning on one day While the other half is doing face-to-face -face learning and then they alternate those days or even doing a morning afternoon That's, That's one question the Second question is really, Are you all still kind of maintaining that level three COVID threat matrix type of, of approach where if there's a case uh, in after you open, then bang, you close back down and go back to distance learning. So two questions. Thank you. And just, I, I owe uh, people an apology. I don't get to see the raised hands because I'm not the host. And so, uh, so sorry if I ignored your hands that were up. Uh, Nevin and Tammy, I have you down as next, but I want to make sure Jim's question is answered. And uh, so that's why I was not responding to the virtual hands, but Stephen's been very kind and is keeping me posted who's got their hands raised. So sorry for that little blip, but uh, Jim's question, does anybody want to answer Jim's question, please? Yeah, Jim, in terms of the, the situation in Luxembourg, that uh, alternate week approach is um, mandated by the government. And so all okay. schools in Luxembourg, private or state schools, will need to follow that uh, model. Uh, and the week, the week on, week yeah. off. Yeah. Okay. We, that prompted a lot of discussion with the uh, faculty uh, and the various stakeholder groups. Uh, and we, we considered... Um, uh, uh, an alternative which would have seen a three day in, three day out thing so that we weren't, it, it's probably the wrong term, but so that we weren't sending kids away in isolation for a full week and then them having to relearn. It, it really to do with the procedures of the social distancing, uh, especially uh, as we get to the younger end of our kids. If, They'll just get used to it by five days in school, then they'll be away for a week. And our sixth graders, for example, will come back in two weeks' time and they'll have forgotten what they're supposed to do with the temperature screening and, and things like that. So our preference would have been for something slightly different from an educational perspective, but we understand that the, logistically that's very, very challenging for and, uh, and parents who are also trying to get back to some work routines as well. Uh, and what we are trying to do with our student groupings 
is to keep siblings together. We've been asked to try and keep siblings together so that they're in the same cohort, regardless of what grade level they're in. Mm -hmm. Again, to make that a little bit easier on the on the families who are trying to get some semblance of normality back in their lives as well. I hope that Thank helps. you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Chris, I have, I see your hands now. I'm a co-host, so I can get to see the hands. Nevin, and then Tammy, and then Chris Vincent. Nevin. Yeah. Welcome and hello. Hi hey everyone, I'm Nevin Sorich. I'm from uh, Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, ICT manager at Zagreb. Uh, so, uh, yes, we are closed for a long time as all as you are and we are now also have the possibility as Croatian schools will open on the 11th of May or at least the government has given a green light but now there are still talks, is that possible or not, not because of the epidemiologist and also because we had an earthquake here so there are still many schools that have been that are still damaged so I doubt that they will open but because of that we as a school we also have to consider opening because there is a number of parents that are, uh, are not so happy to have their kids at home as majority is so uh, with that here is my question because I heard something uh, so at one point you said that uh, kids will be doing online learning and the other one, otherwise, will be a school, and they will have the support at school. So uh, <clears throat> that, when I'm thinking upper school, I, I can see going in my school, but I have a big, at the moment, big worry, question mark, resistance, name it any way you want, from elementary teachers, principals. How can they be at school with the little ones and do the online requirements and work? So my question is here. Is online learning priority in your case? And then the school one is kind of like they get extra while they're in school, or is it opposite? So I just want a little bit more, especially for elementary, because I think it's much harder to do both things at the same time for teachers' workload. So thank you. Thank you, Nevin, for that question. Uh, I don't know if some elementary people want to uh, respond to that. David, do you want to start off? Absolutely. Um, it's an idea we're, we're toying with, Nevin, uh, at the moment. Um, we still have another four and a half weeks before we, we open up. Um, and we've been doing virtual learning now um, for around five weeks in total uh, of virtual learning. We, we are uh, struggling with this idea of having one, half of the class at home and half of the class at school. And so this idea of continuing what we're already doing, which the, uh, the teachers and students are familiar with, and then having students in school to socialize, to be together, and then taking the opportunity of enhancing what they're normally doing, um, or would be normally doing at home, but in with the teacher being present. Uh, so I can give you, uh, give you an example. For example, some of our uh, upper elementary um, students we, they, they, many of them have a morning meeting. That's something that's evolved on a, as a video conference using Zoom or the video on Schoology. And so you could imagine that the teacher then has a group of students in the classroom, six, eight students in the classroom, around six, eight students at home, and they do a, a virtual live video uh, Zoom or Schoology link up. So you've got the teacher there with the video camera and her students present. And then the other students who would normally do it anyway, link up and they do their class morning meeting to set the day and begin things um, in school. Again, there's no roadmap for this. And so um, we, we're literally going to be building the aeroplane as we go along, trying to perfect this for five weeks uh, as we come to the end of this academic year. But that seems to be our plan. We, we toyed with an idea of maybe um trying to do two separately but as you note it's just a huge effort for the for the teachers great david thank you very much uh i'm just going to my list uh tammy hi uh tammy canelli american international school of budapest here in hungary uh, i think my question was actually already answered i was going to ask uh if you chose the one week on one week off on purpose um, because I've heard of other examples of maybe two days on, full clean on Wednesday, and then two days off, or maybe a half day kind of thing. 
um, but I think the question's already been answered. It's pretty much a mandate, so you don't really have a choice, yeah? Uh, well, we actually, uh, yeah, it's kind of a mandate, yes. Mm -hmm. I know that Teresa was interesting, was just in the chat, I don't know if you saw it, she was sharing from Prague that the Czech government is not allowing the alternate. And I don't know if you can maybe elaborate on that, Teresa, because that's an interesting permutation. Um, it's a bit short. I mean, they're supposed to come out with another declaration on the 30th because they're not requiring anybody to, to go back to school and we have not decided yet to go back to school, but they have said the same groups of kids should stay in the same rooms at this point in time. So they don't want alternating. That's been a general um, comment thus far, but it may change in the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. Yes, and then uh, thank you, Tammy. Chris and Jane, I see your hand up. And I'm sorry, I don't, uh, if, I, I just said BIS, so I'll just say that you have a name, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Thanks, John, and uh, good evening. Claire, thank you, Claire. Uh, or Chris Vincent, Director of Technology at the International School of Zug and Luzerne. Um, a, a number of the questions have sort of touched on this and some of the responses, uh, uh, David, most recently also. But I, I wanted to just uh, understand a little bit more about the, um, the considerations for the teachers, um, Phil and David. Of course, uh, we know our faculty extremely resilient, uh, adaptable, and they've taken on so much in their, their stride as we all navigate this uh, sort of new, uh, new world. But, um, I think we've certainly seen at uh, ISL, you know, as we continue to tweak and adjust the con continuity of learning plan, um, there is uh, there is a limit to the capacity of teachers to take on more change. Um, clearly, coming back to school is a significant change, and I wonder, uh, Phil and David, what. Uh, ISDL is doing to acknowledge, to uh, appreciate, uh, to hear uh, the voices of the teachers uh, as you move forward uh, in these plans. Hi, Chris. Um, um, it's a really good point, and, and I think um, in the slide uh, that I put together, that was uh, related to to the first uh, the first um, bullet points on there about how it's helped us to our thinking to evolve much more quickly and to a far deeper level. As soon as we broaden out that conversation from the crisis team alone and then extrapolated out to Steam and uh, Joachim put together David and myself in the same room and said, you guys need to get your heads together. As soon as we took that out to a wider audience, then we really started to, to make progress. Um, I think it's fair to say, though, that the representation has been filtered through. We, we have two uh, August bodies in, in our staffing structure, uh, if you like. They, 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 perform, they create a, it's an awful term, but a, a middle leadership kind of level. Uh, and that's the academic council. That's all our heads of departments, or academic leaders, as we call them, uh, for each of the subject areas in the IB. And we also have a great advisory council, which is, you know, for want of a better phrase, that looks at the pastoral, social, emotional well-being, and it's our, our team leaders for homerooms, advisory groups in the high school and in the middle school. And, and their input has been representative, we think, of their wider teams. So have we gone to every single member of staff in the upper school section and said, what do you think and how do you feel? Not yet, although the HR department have uh, sent a questionnaire out to every single member of staff, whatever their role is in the school, and ask them those questions so that uh, in a confidential manner, people have been able to express their level of vulnerability, their anxieties, or any, any fear they may have. Because somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody right at the beginning said, might have been you, John, you said it's far easier to close the school and move away from danger into the virtual learning environment. And of course, as soon as we talk about moving back into school, people 
understandably feel like they're moving closer to the danger and that's challenging for all of them but as, so long as you know we we, we feel that the time there's a time pressure been applied by the government they only announced recently that the 11th of may we would have to be open that time pressure limits a little bit the 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 the, the, the time we can give to collaborative conversations on this so that's how we managed it we we filter things through the academic council and the great advisory council the upper school leadership team and then the crisis management team and so from those four different groups we think we got a fairly representative feel uh, in terms of testing the temperature of what may or may not work, what the main issues may or may not be. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, David. Thank, uh, so, uh, David's gonna answer uh, further. Yeah. Phil, thank you very much for that. That's really yeah. helpful. Just to add to what Phil has said, um, we also have had involved to a, a certain extent the union representatives uh, the school is a union school um, and the representatives are chosen by the staff and often staff will go to them with um, things that they wish to voice about how the school is operating and so on. So we, we've got them on board um, and the uh, representative for health and safety will be part of one of the teams that te Steve showed you at the beginning. And, and also there'll be a number of staff on those groups. If you remember the um, organigram that Steve uh, put up right at the very beginning that allows us to get some voice from the from the teachers. We, we also uh, insisted from the beginning that the uh, team, the middle leadership teams, um, leaders, they uh, undertook weekly meetings. So we do that as a natu natural um, part of our organization in normal, normal circumstances that the teams uh, meet once or twice a week, subject teams, grade level teams, et cetera. And so they've continued to do that through Zoom and Google Hangouts and so on. And so the principals and, and other leaders have joined those meetings um, and you get a feel of where people are at. And we've asked those team leaders also to help keep an eye out for our staff, ones who are struggling uh, so that we can then direct any help towards them as we see fit. And so hopefully we, we, we're really listening and hearing what the teachers are saying and hearing their questions and the rest of the staff um, as to what they're feeling about the virtual learning and the reopening of school. And in the same vein uh, regarding parents, we have a parent organization, a group of parents that are also filtering a lot of feedback from the parents and the Patricia, our acting head, and the principals have uh, been liaising with them in our community relations. There's a point person tied to them. So there is a bit of that flow. But I think, Chris, your question is an important one. And, and I think the answer here is that if you have this distributed leadership, those are the people to go to because logistically to get everybody's opinion can be very hard and you can kind of go into a conversation that's very uh, kind of focus on one person's anxiety that maybe doesn't address the issues of everybody. So I think the model has been to leverage that dis uh, distributive leadership and those middle leaders that we mentioned. So I think that's what I'm hearing as one of the strategies. Uh, Jane? Hi, everybody. It's really nice to see all of you, I have to say. And um, I wanted to begin, I guess, just to acknowledge really the incredibly heroic and commendable efforts of each and every one of you. Um, this just incredible amounts of anxiety and um, pressure that are out there right now as you're dealing with everybody else's needs. And this actually was brought home to me last week because um, I've been reaching out to um, leaders of schools that we know are in financial difficulty right now. And I think quite unexpectedly, just as we started talking and I asked how we could help, they each started crying. And uh, it's just, you know, really, really difficult. Um, I think sometimes can be overwhelming. So take care of each other and yourselves, even as you're planning to take care of everybody else is my advice. But my question is this one. And it's about, um, you mentioned at the beginning, actually, the very beginning um, in Luxembourg, no visitors on campus. I have a question for you. Does that include the parents 
or are do those do those policies vary where you are in your locations and if if visitors are allowed is there a restriction on how many Jane, can you, I'm sorry, uh, many of us know you, but some of our guests don't. If you could just say the name of your organization and role. Oh, sure. I'm with the Council of International Schools. I'm the executive director. Thank you very much, Jane. I'll let Steve answer in the regards of the Luxembourg uh, rules, and then it would be great to hear from other people in their respective contexts and countries. Steve, please. Um, so yeah, regarding the, the question about the parents, the, yes, the parents are not allowed in the building. They can come to the premises, um, but they cannot enter the building except if there is an urgent uh, meeting to do and uh, they have to have to come. But in principle, nobody will answer, uh, enter the, the buildings. That's a requirement from the Luxembourg government. Okay. Other policies? Anybody else would like to share? I can share from um, what we're doing in, uh, in Munich, um, just as we started our um, uh, emergency care for critical workers this week, parents are not allowed on, on campus and we have a very organized drop off and pick up that um, is done with the right amount of spacing and so forth. I think the guiding piece has been certainly whatever it is that the ministry in our, in our country is saying, but also the, the fewer the number of people we have in a building the less likely of transmission. So we've continued to kind of make our decisions um, with that in mind as well. Looks like maybe John Micton froze. There he is. The machine is uh, <laughs> Uh, Jim, you still have your hand up? Another question? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. That was a, a question. Do your school popu uh, populations or, or your school um, communities have a significant numbers of parents who are deciding to keep their kids home even when you reopen and or their companies are not allowing them back, et cetera, et cetera? so that they will have to continue with distance learning? If so, how are you gonna balance the, the needs of, uh, you know, kind of the face-to-face -face learning component with those who are doing full-on distance learning for, for the foreseeable future? Anybody, Claire, I haven't forgotten you. Any, uh, David? Well, yeah, sure. Um, at the moment, we don't have a clear picture of exactly how many students will be coming into school. We know that a few of the parents left the country uh, and of course trying to get back into a country in, in this moment is, is tricky. Um, we're aware of a few parents who have decided they won't be sending their children in for the for the time being or will just keep them off until the summer. Um, but as I mentioned from a lower school context we are looking to continue the virtual learning. Yeah, so that's our, that's our uh, main thrust. And then the students that come in, they have this enhancement. But using the virtual learning uh, program and uh, platforms to continue with those that are still at home. This is um, that, um, first off, the, John mentioned about our obligations to, um, to match the, uh, the legislation of the Luxembourgish government in terms of the Ministry of Education and the various edicts that come from there. And um, we have just informed teachers in our latest of the other crisis team have informed teachers today that in terms of the Luxembourgish government, when the school is open, if you are resident in Luxembourg with a school aged child and your school is open, then you are expected to send your child to school. So we will have to, we will have to record attendance because we have to uh, report attendance figures uh, to the ministry uh, on occasion. Um, um, our message to parents is if we are open, you are expected not necessarily by us, but by the Luxembourgish government to send your child to school. And if you choose not to, you have to inform the school in the same way and using the same 
channels that you would uh, in normal circumstances. So absence is expected through uh, illness uh, or, uh, or other um, sort of authorised uh, manner and you would need the evidence from physicians or from employers or whatever in order to, to, to record the absence of your child. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, David mentioned a few times now about in the lower school and there's a, uh, there, there's a drive to maintain the, the virtual learning program. Um, to be absolutely transparent, uh, 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 in the upper school section, that is, that is something which is causing a great deal of conversation amongst academic leaders uh, and about from the delegation about workload issues, real or perceived, um, and that's something that I, I wouldn't, in all honesty, be able to sit here tonight and say to you that, well, from grade six through 11, we're also going to do the same thing. And again, it, it will have to go back to that purpose, uh, we, we defining the purpose of our children being back in school for seven weeks and what the purpose is. And that is actually what will drive the decision about what kind of work and what kind of interaction teachers and students will be expected to have on the days that they come to school and the days that they spend out of school. So that's still in flux with regard to the faculty from 6 to 11. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Claire. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire from the Bavarian International School. I'm the pastoral coordinator. Um, I had a question about uh, when the kids are actually in school. David, sorry, you, you froze a little bit on me earlier, so I'm not sure if you said that your students will be transitioning or whether they'd be staying in one room. Uh, my question relates to, to the number of children in school and how you're going to manage their behavior whilst they're in school. You said they're going to have their lunch in homerooms, um, but during breaks, I mean, what kind of breaks do you envisage? Do you, uh, do you perceive them being able to go outside and get in fresh air? If so, how's that gonna be policed to make sure that they maintain the two meter distancing? Mm -hmm. um, and if they are transitioning, um, you're using this one-way system, I assume, will you stagger transition as well? Okay, lots of questions there. Thanks I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully I'll answer them all. Uh, so just going I'm back... Glad you're uh, David and not me. <laughs> <laughs> just going back to the, the, the first one you mentioned, uh, the idea is to try and keep our lower school students uh, in their homeroom base. So some of the specialist lessons will occur in the homeroom. Uh, one of the dictates of the Luxembourgish government has been that all PE and gymnasium, gymnasiums will be shut and PE lessons will, uh, they use the word abolished, so there'll be no PE. Okay. And so that's one of the, the dictates that they, they put out to us. Um, so to, to answer some of your questions here, yes we're going to stagger um, we have actually have a staggered schedule at the moment in the lower school, so we, it probably will mean we stagger grade levels a little bit uh, in terms of when they take a break. And so I foresee uh, either the homeroom teacher, but more so these PE teachers who now are no longer undertaking PE lessons. Uh, my thinking at the moment is that they uh, do 20 minutes, they take the students for 20 minutes, uh, hopefully outside. There's nothing being said by the government that we cannot go outside at all. In fact, uh, as a country, uh, the government and the Prime Minister have encouraged us to go outside so long as we are um, doing the social distancing initially and now wearing masks in situations where there are a number of people. So we, we don't have anything that will stop us from going outside. We have a, a reasonable amount of space outside. Our challenge will be is trying to maintain four-year-olds, five-year-olds, eight-year-olds distancing from each other. And so that is something that we really will be a work in progress, trying to, trying to do that. But I, I, th I, I mean, Steve, you can help me with this. I don't think the government are expecting us to make sure that the kids are always two meters away from each other. Um, but what they want to try and do is keep this small group of children together. So you've got six, eight, 
possibly 10 students and they are a small group that just stay together during the course of the day. Thanks. Um, you. Just one final question. I'm yeah, squeeze, of course, Claire, please. I'm going to squeeze one more in before my time's gone. Was that um, you said you're going to stagger entry and exit from school as well. Does that yeah. mean that your overall school day will be shorter for each of these groups? Okay, so we we currently under normal circumstances we we are, students can arrive from eight o'clock, and school starts at eight twenty-five. So under normal circumstances, we already have a twenty-five minute window uh, mm -hmm. for arrivals, and so the money that Steve mentioned that we spent on the temperature testing, uh, obviously when the upper school start on the first day with the half of the the school, we'll see how quickly we can get the students through the temperature test. Um, and as I mentioned in my part of the presentation, a, a daily reflection upon how that is going uh, will help us in the lower school determine whether that 25 minute window, and, as, and just like any other school, we have students who turn up at uh, uh, 8.45. So in fact, we have an even bigger window and I can see the window will go right up until nine o'clock uh, with the temperature testing. Uh, as students come in. So for the moment, we, we're not going to say, okay, grade four, you're, you can arrive at 8.10. Um, we realize the vagaries of the Luxembourg is traffic in the morning and the commute is not going to allow that to happen. So we already have that uh, built in, we'll see whether it actually works and whether or not we need to do some modifications to that. And we also have a staggered exit to the, uh, to the day as a normal case. Um, preschool, for example, they leave at three o'clock and then they, that goes right up to around 3.30 when the grade five leaves. So that's something that already exists as a, a normal situation and uh, we are looking to use that and uh, change it maybe to allow students to come out of the building and meet their parents um, in a staggered way. The problem will be trying to organize the parents, and that's where Steve and I will have a bit of a challenge, is we often have mm -hmm. 300 parents at the end of the day waiting at the front of the lower school to pick up their children. So how do we ensure that they um, maintain social distancing? That will be something of a challenge for us, but we have some ideas there. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. Not in the upper school section, Claire. Um, regarding the upper school section it's a little bit different and what might interest you in your role as the pastoral coordinator the in order to um, uh, sort of ameliorate the the impact of the the slow entry and gradual entry across what's likely to be an hour maybe an hour plus in the morning after student arrival passing through the temperature control the uh, students, once they pass through control, will go directly on entrance to the building. They will go to their homeroom in grades six, seven, and eight and spend time with their homeroom teacher or their advisory room uh, in nine, 10, and 11. And the school day will be set to begin at around about, the school day usually begins 8.25, but we are looking at a 9.25, probably, and it could be a little bit after that. So, um, but it also, it allowed for our pastoral teams to get some satisfaction in what they sense as being really, really important is that on the, on the beginning of every day, giving kids a chance to check in with their homeroom teacher, their advisor about how they are, how they feel about the day ahead and what they did the day before. And, and looking at it from a purely pastoral perspective. So we're building that in. And that's one of those things which it meets the demands and the, the real need as expressed by the uh, advisory council. And it also helps us enormously logistically because we needed something to cushion that bow of the, the impact of that sort of driven drab entry at the beginning of the day. The lunchtime in the senior school, the lunchtime is the area which is causing greatest concern because we can't do lunches in our in a set in a teaching learning room. We will have a bit more student transition than they will in the lower school. And so lunchtime is, is still being refined in how we do that. 
and that's likely to be a two hour period which brings about the most significant changes to what we would normally see as our regular schedule. But aside from that, we're exploring the possibility of, a, of finishing an hour earlier. Again, no decision on that yet. But one of the reasons behind that is uh, because of the uh, extra anxiety that teachers and students will have because of the severe restrictions on their movement and, and, and the regular day. Also, the fact that we need a chance at the end of each day to review how the day has gone and to make alternative plans if necessary for the next day. And also Steve and his team, they need to have time, a, a greater period of time, to be able to get in and deal with any um, sort of maintenance and, and clear cleansing and hygiene issues that need to be done in order for us to be ready to go again at 8.25 the next day. So those are the kinds of things that are still developing. But the first thing in the morning thing, purely pastoral, purely driven by socio-emotional needs of students, and it helps us out enormously. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think you've got a good plan uh, in the you. making there. Great, thank you. Now, I know that uh, Sherry at the beginning and Kevin's here and Claire, they're all at the Bavarian International School and you've had partial opening. So you're having some kids in your building. I don't know if you'd like to just describe what that's looking like and what some of the things, parameters that you have with the kids that are already in your school. So it is a very small number of children. I want to say like five on one campus and three or four on the other. And so but in needing to have this ready for this past Monday, our primary principals um, really took the lead on this and um, just put, put together a plan that involved the right amount of spacing, the structures, um, uh, the, the, the health checks in the morning. We aren't taking temperature, and I'm not sure if that's something that the, the Bavarian authorities are going to have us do. That seems like a, a really... Um, it's a complicating factor for, for you guys in Luxembourg that you've had to really schedule and, and plan around. So I, I don't know if that's going to be something we'll, we'll be needing to do in the future. Um, right now, it looks like we may need to be having two grade levels coming back. And it was, I just will say, it's been really wonderful to hear your um, planning because you've had to plan um, so much bigger and uh, um, to, to, to so much levels of detail that are really helpful for us. And I'm, I'm glad to have members of my team here to help with that thinking. I think the one thing that is keeping me awake at night, because I feel like a lot of these technical things, you know, you get the right people around a table and you can really come up with solutions. The piece that I'm struggling with or I'm worried about is unraveling the learning and the amazing things that have happened with distance learning as we bring uh, students back and we try to navigate um, a, a flipped classroom or a model that doesn't burn out our teachers um, and it still honors um, powerful learning. So that's that's an area that um, is something that we're spending some we're spending some time in as well but it's right now where we are the technical things need to be managed first so uh, that that's one thing I'll let Kevin or Claire if there's anything you want to add to, to that. Just a clarification, uh, Luxembourg government has not required us to take temperature. It is a decision by the school, just so that, that's, that's a decision that the school uh, made, yeah, for our community. Thank you, I Patricia, agree. for clarifying that. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Sharon in regards to distance learning. The one thing I query is if you've got some students off campus doing it, doing distance learning, you've got students on campus, running following a normal schedule there's going to be conflict between the two and i think it's going to put a lot of pressure on teachers to try to maintain two different kinds of schedules at the same time especially we don't even know um how we're going to have kids back on site right now whether we're having a whole cohort whether we're going to alternate days um so i i personally feel that if we are alternating it's going to be quite messy to try to maintain um, and an increased schedule on campus. I do agree with whoever said it that um, enhancing what is provided when the students are in school is the way to go. So for example, if they're in the science uh, room, they could be um, having access to some of the materials. I don't know to what extent that will be possible. 
um, but certainly the teachers can provide a different level of service if they're face to face with their students than what they can do when they're distance learning. Great, Claire. Any other thoughts? I think it's a great question and, and sorry that you're staying up all night about this, Sherry, but I think it's, thank you that you are because it's a great provocation. Is this idea of the tension between distance learning or however you want to call it and then coming back to school and how do you balance both of those? And I think it'd be interesting if anybody else has some ideas on the curriculum side, what are some of those tensions? And I think Phil really emphasized that the thing that really helped was that the purpose was defined and it was at first that it's social distancing and getting us into that mode with a phased approach as he mentioned to this learning so it's more a phase transition but i'd love to hear from the floor just some thoughts about that creative tension between distance learning and then juggling the coming back especially if you have these two cohorts coming back and forth or even some reflections about distance learning so far in your context Larry, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, th I mean, yes, we're all going through the Larry, same. Larry, can you introduce which school you're at oh. and your role, please? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Larry Love, I'm Director of Technology at the American School of Paris. Um, you know, we've, I think in some ways, as um, educational technology people, we've all been quite excited about how our teachers have taken to distance learning and you know, how they've been willing to try out some tools that we may may have had more difficult getting them to try in the past. So that's been sort of fantastic. But I think we're all also conscious of the fact there are many aspects of school that kids are missing out on, you know, and so it's how to how to hold those two things together. And you know, so we're in our, we have only a few weeks of school left. We're just wondering about this whole, um, how do we bring kids back? Uh, we don't have to, as, um, as has already been noted in France, we have some choice about that, but it's, um, what we're trying to do is to get some experience under our belt because it could be in the fall that we're all back to something like this. You know, it could become normal that we're going to have to uh, manage social distancing in our schools, and that may mean having only half the kids there at a time and all that sort of thing. So it's it's really a matter of playing with some of those ideas. And so we we are also looking at that idea of having the kids come back. Maybe having you know we have a um, an eight day cycle, but it basically it's two sets of classes alternating every two days. So we're wondering about for our middle and upper school having our kids back for two days and then home for two days while the other half of the kids are there for two days. And what we would do is focus on the stuff that it would be great to be able to do with the kids there face to face. So that would include some of those things like science labs to the extent that are possible but also artsy sort of things music drama all those sort of things that we'd like to be able to do some of even if it's modified to once again respect social distancing but because for a lot of our kids that stuff's really really important and although we we can see that we can do a pretty good job of distance learning in things like math and and english and social studies and and science and languages we can do a reasonably good job of those things um, with some compromises. There are some other subjects that we just can't do a decent job of at all, even though our, our teachers are very creative about trying to give the kids something meaningful to do. So, so we like the idea of having a bit of a play with having the kids at school under the limitations of you know social distancing. So having half the kids there at a time, middle and upper school, having this two days on, two days off. And then the teachers don't have to you know, we, we've said very strongly we don't want any teacher to have to deal with two modes of teaching, face-to-face -face plus distance learning. That's not, not realistic to do that. So could we get teachers to think about the way they deliver that content so they do the stuff that is best done face-to-face -face on, on when, when they have the kids physically there in the classroom with them. Then the next time that they would normally see those kids, uh, they, those kids are working on some stuff they've set them in the online learning platform and then um, so the, the teachers need to plan a little bit like a flipped classroom approach but you know sort of modified for uh, what we're trying to do for the for the elementary school kids we think that with the number of um, kids who won't be coming to school because their parents want them at home we may be able to because we have more than one section at each grade level of course we could have we could consolidate some of the the kids will be physically at school into some classes with teachers and then maybe one teacher in each grade level uh, would be doing the distance learning component for the kids who are not at school. So, and they may rotate through that role or they may just specialize. They may decide, yeah, this person's a real whiz at doing distance learning with the younger kids and this one's better at face-to-face. -face. So 
we're just trying to hold the line at saying we don't want teachers to have to do two modes of teaching at the same time. That's pretty much impossible. Yeah, and I like this idea that you're saying is that, you know, with different sections of a school, if you have enough numbers of kids still at home and an equivalent number at school, having uh, taking advantage of the different skill sets and profiles of your teachers. I think that's a really interesting idea. I'm mindful of time. We agreed to stay till 830 and uh, we're about to wrap up. I want to thank everybody again for joining us and our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for, I know they, these guys have been so busy and when I told them to make a slide, you can imagine what they said, but no, they were fantastic. Thank you so much, David, Phil, and Steve for sharing your expertise. And Steve has very generously put his email up. So if you would like to tap into uh, some of the workflows that he has, just reach out. And of course, Phil and David and myself are available. So don't hesitate. And I wanna thank Simon and Stephen and on behalf of Learning2, thank you so much for supporting these virtual conversations. We hope to have more. And this will be recorded and shared to you. And the chat is also uh, kept. So you'll have those resources delivered to you so you can also access them. Or if you just go to Virtual Threads, Learning2 Europe, all the uh, recordings and resources from the different conversations are available to you. So for everybody in the room, thank you very much. Be healthy, be safe, and best of luck with all these different permutations and the pivoting back to this new normal. And we look forward to hearing from everybody and sharing. And thank you again. Have a lovely evening. And David, Phil, and Steve, on behalf of Learning2, thank you very much for your expertise and time in these busy times. Thank you.